Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you, um, Paul and HT, for putting this up for Raghu. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to speak about is, is a joint work with uh, um, a student of mine, uh, Konstantin Reke from Münster. Um, so, you know, I, I was not prepared to give like slides, so I prepared it last night, so I'm pretty sure there are mistakes, so uh, uh, we'll see. So, <laughs> okay, so, um, so the setup is the following. So you have um, a finitely generated group uh, and a, a Cayley graph that is associated with this. So, um, you know, think of s simplest examples are, are, you know, the Cayley graph is a tree, so for which the, the finitely generated group is a group of two elements. This is the free group. And uh, what you do is, so the, in a general setting, you have the, the vertices are the group elements, and then you sort of join edges between the vertices, and so G is a, is a vertex, and S is a little s is, a, is an element of the symmetric generating set, then uh, you draw an edge between G and GS. Okay. So, um, so what, is, what are we going to do here is we are going to study some percolations on this graph. Okay. So there are several ways to think of this. So one way is that we think of this as a random subgraph of the Cayley graph. An equivalent way is to think of them as probability measure on the edges, because if you want to look at bond percolations. Okay, so any invariant probability measure, any gamma invariant probability measure on, on the set of edges is called a gamma invariant bond percolation. So here it should be a capital gamma. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, so what is an example of this? So an example is, the most familiar example is, is Bernoulli percolation on, on the graph. So you can retain or delete edges independently with a certain prescribed probability P, which is between zero and one. But of course, there are, there are many other percolations, dependent percolations that are not Bernoulli percolation. And somehow the aim of the talk is to give examples of these and see how and whether they play an important role, okay? So what, what would be an example of, of a percolation that is, that is not IID but invariant is you can just, you know, take a graph and then color vertices red with independently with probability one half and then take a vertex, fix some radius and then you can say that, okay, you just choose, you know, you just declare the random subgraph to be all the vertices that are within a distance r, where the, the proportion of red edges is between, let's say, 40 and 60%, right? So if you move this, this, this random subgraph, if you translate it, it doesn't change, but of course it's not Bernoulli percolation, okay? Okay, so, um, so here's a notation that we are going to use throughout this talk, so which is uh, the two-point function or also the connectivity. So this is defined as the probability that two vertices find them, you know, are connected in the, they, they, they are in the same connected component of omega. Okay, so this tau function is going to play a very important role here, this connectivity. Um, and, and one of the very simple observations, but very important one, as we'll see, is an observation of Eisenman and Newman from early 80s is that, that if you have an invariant percolation on a graph, then the two-point function is a positive definite kernel, okay? So it's a two-line proof of, of, uh, of this. It just relies on the fact that it's invariant and um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, very important uh, fact that we'll, that we'll see later. Okay. So, um, right, so that's, that's one fact that, uh, that's, uh, it's worth recording now. Um, now, so what we are going to look at is, you know, study some property of the group, uh, 
and one important property that is probably known to, to most of us is, is called amenability. So a group, very informally speaking, a group is called amenable if, so the Cayley, you look at the Cayley graph, study any Cayley graph of this, and then the boundary of this is negligible compared to the volume. Okay, this is a very rough definition of amenability. So what is, what is, what is an example? ZD is amenable. What is it? Something that is not amenable is the tree, right? So there's lots of boundary, and the boundary is large for a tree, and in ZD it's not. Okay. So, so the starting point of this is a, is a very influential and beautiful paper by Benjamini, uh, Lyons, Perez, and Schramm from uh, 1999. So they started this, all this, um, this, you know, there's a precursor to this is a paper by Benjamini and Schramm about percolation beyond ZD. Um, many questions and few answers, and then there's a follow-up, there are many follow-up works, but the one that is going to play an important role here is this, this paper. So it says that you can characterize this geometric property of, of the group probabilistically by running a percolation process on this. So it says that if, you know, a group is amenable, if and only if, for any alpha, any number between zero and one, you can come up with an invariant percolation with two competing properties, okay? So the first is, is it should be invariant. And the, and the first property, the, the first non-trivial property is that, that the degree, the expected degree is alpha times the most it can be. So if you're, instead of, you know, bond percolation, if you're just looking at site percolation, it would just mean that the probability that zero is in the component of omega is at least alpha. Okay. So this means it's, it has arbitrarily large marginals. And the second property is that it has only finite clusters. Okay. So how can it be that it has, it has uh, so large marginals, you can make the marginals as large as you as you want, but still come up with it in fi only finite clusters. Okay. So, so this is so. First of all, so the simplest percolation, uh, you know, percolations we can think of is Bernoulli percolation, and Bernoulli percolation will never do this. Okay, because okay, instead of invariant, let's look at Bernoulli percolation. Then this, the first property is that it's the p parameter, so alpha is just p. So if you make p sufficiently large, then as long as your group has, you know, some growth which is, which is not linear, then it has been shown recently, this conjecture has been verified by Dumilil Kopan and others, that you will always, have pc is less than one. So meaning that you will always have infinite clusters, okay? So Bernoulli percolation is never going to get, to, get you to amenability. But invariant percolations would. Okay. So this is this is perhaps an, an, an important fact to remember. So um, so somehow apparently two conflicting properties. The only only things that will do will do the job are the are the invariant percolations. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes, this is an extremely good question. So they do. So it's not that it's an abstract argument that you just, there exists something, but they do come up with the percolations. And this finite cluster, it's a beautiful application of something called mass transport principle. And this finite clusters are the ones which are your Fellner sets. You build your invariant mean from these finite clusters. Okay. But it relies on something which is very important and which is very special to amenability, namely that amenability is a property that's, that's, you know, it's a property of the group and not of the graph. Because if one graph of, of, of an amenable group, if one graph is amenable, then all other graphs are, okay? So in the sense that it's a property which is invariant under quasi-isometries, okay? And, and this is the property that is crucially used in their proof when they, when they build these Fellner sets out of these finite clusters. 
And that's not so true for other properties of groups, which if, as soon as you want to go beyond amenability. So, so there was also then a follow-up survey by Lyons, and, uh, and it was noted there that all the probabilistic characterizations of geometric properties are restricted to only to amenability. And um, is it possible to go beyond this? So, so are there other properties of groups that we can you know, understand as probabilists? Okay? So of course, there are, there are many other ways of understanding groups, geometric properties of groups, functionalitic and, 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 and algebraic and so on. But probabilistically, are there methods that allow you to go beyond amenability? And as I was mentioning before, so you know, mass transport principle, which is, is a very powerful tool, does not really apply. Okay, so some concrete properties are of interest, which, which were mentioned there in this, in this uh, survey paper of Lyons. It's known as the Herup property. So, okay, it's not really known in the probabilistic community, and I, I don't want to go too much into this because there is a reason not to go into this at the moment. So, uh, so there is a formal definition which uh, you can read from the slides. At, at least, you know, it, it basically says that groups which can be, you know, which admit some equivariant way of being embedded into Hilbert spaces. So, what is an example? That's the best way to look at it. So, the example is the free group. Okay. So, or the tree. Um, and then there is a very contrasting property known as Kashdan's property T, which is essentially, it's a, again, I don't want to go into the formal definition, uh, but it is a strong, strong negation of Herup property. Okay? So if you allow me to write, draw a picture here. So, so Herup property is, let's say, so amenable groups are, will be here, and this will be the Herup property groups. And property T would be somewhere here, okay? And there will be groups which are neither, okay? So, so the question is, is there any, any probabilistic, any constructive way of characterizing these groups in, in probabilistic terms? Okay. So um, our goal is to somehow, you know, not worry about these definitions, and there are many equivalent characterizations of this. But somehow come up with something hopefully more hands-on. Okay. So, so yeah. So probably it's instructive to start with the with the example that's we are not here, but perhaps here. It's here. So the free group of two elements, the tree. Okay. So um, so what happens here? So so this is non-amenable, as mentioned before. So let's consider Bernoulli percolation here, okay? So it's known that PC is less than one, so there will be uh, infinite clusters if you go beyond. So let's fix some, some P, you know, supercritical Bernoulli percolation on this. Then, so what we know is that, that the two-point function of Bernoulli percolation on the tree, right, so this is, if the distance grows, then the two-point function decays exponentially. Right? It's bird, you know, independence, so we just multiply p g times where g is the distance. Okay. But actually, there is not only there are infinite clusters, but actually you observe that there are actually infinitely many infinite clusters. If you are supercritical, it's an FKG argument, right? Because if look at the two-point function between G and H, let's say. If we pretend that there is a unique infinite cluster, then this two-point function is at least the probability that the cluster at G is infinity and the cluster at H is infinity, right? If there is a unique infinite cluster. Since these are increasing events, the probabilities will multiply and these probabilities will just you look at the square, and this will be positive, which will contradict the fact that the two-point function is vanishing at infinity. So that means that, you know, if any of you are supercritical, if you have large marginals, does not prevent you from having infinitely many infinite clusters, but perhaps the two-point function, decaying two-point function, is the right way to look at it. Okay, 
maybe just asking for finitely many finite clusters is perhaps not really applying here in the case of something that is non-amenable. So, um, so perhaps we should look for properties that combine sufficiently large marginals, but two-point function decay. Okay. Questions so far? No? Okay. okay. So, so let's extend this example of a tree. Okay. So what is the what is the distinguishing property of a tree? So if we just remove one edge, right, it disconnects the graph, right? So essentially, you can think of the graph as, as some set, and then you can think of the edge as some kind of a wall. So if you, if you put the wall, then it just separates the two components, okay? So let's take this perspective and consider a set, and let W be a set of partitions of the set. So partition means it just, you know, take a point, so either it's here or it's in the complement. Uh, and we say that W in script W separates two distinct points if X and Y belong to two different classes. Okay. And uh, by Cal W, I denote by all the walls separating X and Y. And I want to assume that the number of walls separating two distinct points is finite. So just if you want to have a picture, tree is perhaps instructive. Okay. So now, so there was no, no group so far. So now, let so, so the gamma acts by translations. Let's say so it acts on 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 the on the space. And I want something from these actions. I want that there's a wall structure associated to the space. Yeah. Yeah, wall is is just a partition of the set. Yes. Other questions? Yeah. Partition, you mean only you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. So, so I want that. Okay. So so far that was just a space with walls. Okay. So it's a simple concept just in belonging to two different classes. So now, suppose a group just moves around these walls, okay, by translation, let's say. So what do you want from this action? You want that the, this action preserves the wall structure, okay? So that means that if W is, is a wall separating X, W, X, Y, comma, Y is a wall separating X and Y, then W gamma X comma gamma Y is also a wall separating gamma X and gamma Y. Okay. So I think this is reasonable to ask. And uh, what I also want is that this action is proper. So it means that if, you know, if you look at some base point X zero, and it doesn't matter which X zero is because if for some X zero and therefore for all, so let's just fix some. Then, as the distance between x0 and where it's, it gets translated increases, then the number of walls should increase, okay? So the number of walls separating a base point and where it gets pushed, it, it, it grows as the distance also grows. Any other questions? It's the, the, the distance between the, the, the Cayley graph metric, the, the, the word metric, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. Say again. W of gamma X, gamma Y? Yeah. Uh, is the wall separating gamma X and gamma Y? So, so I, so, so the gamma as, okay, so th what you're saying probably is that the action, whether the action extends to an action on the walls, it's true, it does, yes. Okay, so, so you want that uh, the wall structure, you don't want it to be perturbed, but you also want that the distance, okay, so that's, that's, these are the three properties. 
Okay, so what do we want from this? So if these three conditions hold, then you say that there is a proper action on a space with walls. Okay, so Eyal, you had a question? No, okay. Okay, so let's fix, let's assume that there is one such action. So we want to build a percolation, okay? But where? We want to build a percolation on the Cayley graph from this action on the space of walls. So suppose someone tells us that there is such an action and I want to build a decent percolation on my Cayley graph. And I want to see what properties I can deduce from such an action. Okay. Okay. So, so fix, so fix such an action and fix a sequence of IID random variables with probability, okay, success probability P. So you, someone walks on the walls and if you see a head, you mark it one and, and, and if you see a tail, you mark it zero. And given this randomness, here is a way to construct a bond percolation. So you declare an edge open, okay, if either of the following thing happens. So if the base point did not really move by, by this G and A or by H, so this remains stationary, or it does, and then on all the walls separating these two distinct points, you must have seen a head. Okay? So you want to build an, a random subgraph of your Cayley graph, and that's the way, that's what I propose, that that's the way that we do. Okay. And denote the law of the random subgraph by P of P, where P is coming from this fixed parameter that we have here. Okay. So you have, okay, so you, you have this property that, that dictates uh, when the edges will be open. And then, so one observation is that, that this, because Bernoulli is IID, right? So it's stationary, so it's going to be invariant. So if you take a cylinder set in your edge set and then push it around, then it's not going to move. So it's the invariance. And the second property is that, that okay, this is perhaps not as obvious, but so if you look at the marginal, so the probability that the edge is in this component of omega, then it should go to one as P goes to one because of the following reason. Okay, so I wanted to write something, but maybe Let's just say it verbally. So let's look at the left-hand side. So when is the edge possibly present? So this probability is either when the, the base point did not move, so it's the indicator function that gx0 is equal to hx0, right? That's the first one. Or it has moved, so these are two distinct points, and then you have the, all the walls appearing there. Right? These are the only two scenarios that exhaust you. But then for the second scenario, the probability under the Bernoulli measure that this happens is p to the power the number of walls that, is, that separate you. Right? And in the second case, as p goes to 1, since the number of walls separating gx0 and hx0 is finite, that's what we have postulated right before. So the second thing goes to 1, and therefore these two indicators add up to 1. So it has large marginals. And let's look at the two-point function. So it's the probability that, uh, let's say, uh, the identity and G in the same cluster. So this probability is at most, okay, so that requires a picture, which uh, I don't know whether I should draw <laughs> in this. But, uh, okay, let's try to visualize this. So let's, I claim that this, this probability is less than equal to the probability that all the walls, you must have seen heads on all the walls separating x0 and gx0. Why? Um, it's best, okay. So, so imagine x0 is here and gx0 is here. And then if, the, if 0 and g is connected, 
Then in the Cayley graph, you must see a sequence of open paths taking you from x0 to gx0, right? And then if w separates, let's say, x0 and gx0, then you must have found some edge that was, you know, chopped by this wall, right? And that will happen for all walls that separate you. So for all walls, you must have seen uh, a head um, that all walls separating x0 and gx0, you must have seen a head. I'm sorry, it's probably not described best in words, but in pictures, but I've been told I should not write or draw too much. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if that's the case, then let's, okay, it's Bernoulli, so it's p to the raised to the power number of walls, again, separating you, separating the base point and the translate. But as now, g goes to infinity, right? As the distance between the identity and g grows, since the action is proper, the number of walls also grows. So this goes to zero exponentially. Does that make sense? Okay, and this is where we use the, pro the, pro uh, the action is proper, so it's decaying connectivity. It at, yeah, so exactly, but okay, so you're right, so if, uh, absolutely, so if I assume that this grows linearly, the, the wall distance, it's a very good point actually, but in my head it's, it's, it's linear growth, so, but it's, it's a very good point because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between how wall distances grow and how two, points func two point functions decay, okay? And you can milk out a lot of inform quantitative information from this, but you're right, so we don't know that, but yeah, if you pretend that there is a linear growth, then it does. Thanks. Okay, so other questions? So, so now you can push this construction a bit further. So instead of having this discrete picture of counting measure and so on, you can throw it away and imagine that there is a space with measured walls. So instead of the counting measure, you have a measure mu, okay? So now it's slightly more difficult, but it's, it's not, conceptually it's the same. So, so you assume that again, a group acts properly on space with measured walls. So again, the number of walls gets replaced by the measure of the, of the walls. So, and now, you know, instead of Bernoulli, consider a Poisson point process with intensity, and here it's important, intensity, which is mu times one minus P, and you imagine that P is very close to one. So the intensity is very low, okay? So you want to put walls, you know, you want to sample walls, Poisson walls with this intensity, and the walls are somehow should be thought of as hindrances to your edges, okay? And therefore you want low intensity. So, so you declare an edge open if the number of Poisson walls separating these two points, gx0 and hx0 is zero. So then, you know, Poisson point process is, is invariant. So the invariance is clear. Again, so the marginals that the probability that an edge is present is e to the power minus the intensity. And if g and h remain fixed, again, by the same argument as before, as p goes to one, this goes to one. And the connectivity is by a similar argument as before, is, is bounded above by the probability that the Poisson walls, number of Poisson walls is zero, because that's what we have said. And by Poisson, this is e to the power minus the same thing, but the action is proper. So this goes to uh, the, this, ex, this measure of the, 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 the walls separating zero and g, this goes to infinity as g goes to infinity, meaning the distance of g goes to infinity. Um, therefore, we also have decaying connectivity for this. Okay. So, so here is the theorem. So you have Heru property, okay? And you can take this to be the definition if you like to. 
if and only if, given any alpha, there exists a invariant bond percolation with marginal larger than alpha. And instead of finite clusters, you just have decaying connectivity. Okay. And it, the story goes much further and, and deeper, but okay, so I, I don't want to go into this. But let's just make some comments. So percolations are built explicitly here. So it's not that it's, you know, there is a mere existence theorem. Actually, it tells you that how should percolations look like with these two prescribed properties. And they have a meaning in terms of the group. And um, for the converse direction, so I assumed that, okay, so just one line about the proof. So there is a theorem that says that if group has Heru property, then it admits a proper action with a space with measured walls, and therefore you can do this. And conversely, you use this eisenman newman characterization that the two-point function is positive definite, and therefore a group will have Heru property if there is a sequence of positive definite functions, your two-point functions, converging pointwise to one, but decaying to zero at when the distance grows, vanishing at infinity. Okay, so this is, you know, it's, it's a probably not best explained like this, is a much deeper uh, story behind it, but basically that's what it relies upon. Um, so also there is a quantitative version of this. So I was just mentioning, as Atila pointed out, so there is a, for most Heru groups, we know that this DK of the two-point function is actually exponential, okay, for most interesting groups. And for general ones, there is a quantitative version that says that the decay is, is in one-to-one -one correspondence between how your wall distance grows. Okay, if the wall distance grows like this, then your two-point function decays like this. Free group is exponential, I'm writing this. So, so the, for the free group is exponential. For you know, another group called lamp lighter, so for free groups, it's also exponential. For the isometric group of the hyperbolic plane, it's you know, exponential. So many interesting cases, you do have really exponential decay. So, and, and the difficulty here is, is uh, okay, I was mentioning, okay. So, um, okay, so what about the other, in, other, proper, other classes of groups, Karstan's property? So, it should be a strong negation of Heru property, right? So, so it says that it, it, it has the Heru, it has Karstan's, prop, Karstan's property T, if and only if there exists a threshold call it alpha star, okay? And it's quantitative, actually, such that if your marginals ex exceed this quantitative threshold, as soon as it just goes just above this, then the two-point function is uniformly bounded away from zero. Okay? So it's a very strong, you know, strong, um, uh, the star property is, means it's, it, it, it's extremely well connected. Okay, so it could happen, you know, it's not that the other theorem or this theorem is a consequence of the other because, you know, as I was mentioning here, lots of groups will be here <coughs> as well, which miss both. And it could happen that the two-point function is, you know, may vanish along one direction but remain uniformly bounded away from zero along other directions. Okay, it's a lack of spherical symmetry in Cayley graphs. Um, and, and there is... Also, you know, a very important paper of Lyons and Schramm, which shows that so any any invariant insertion tolerant and ergodic bond percolation satisfying this property, this you know, uniformly bounded away from zero, it has a unique infinite cluster. Okay, so put these two together, then you see that on Kasdan groups, as soon as you go just above alpha star, it has a unique infinite cluster. So Kasdan groups have a tendency of forming unique infinite clusters, and they tend to be connected in a very efficient manner, using as few edges as possible, maybe like expanders. Okay, so, um, so what's the message? So what's reasonable definition of Heru property for probabilists? So, Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this on the next slide, okay. Yeah, offer, yes. We 
so which one? Sorry, I don't hear. Lattice? Lattice, no. See, amenable is. I didn't understand the question, but okay, but okay, 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 okay. The word I see. Okay, okay. Okay. Questions? Other questions? Yeah. Okay. So, so what's the what's you know uh, what's the take here? So consider the Cayley graph as an infinite connected network, and you know, assign someone the task to find a strategy, a random invariant strategy of disconnecting the graph. Okay. So, so what's the what's the deal? So, the strategy is successful if vertices that are far apart, okay, is disconnected with high probability. Okay. So, if the distance between two vertices grow, then the probability that it's disconnected will go to. Okay, but you know you don't allow the hacker to disconnect it, you know, just at random, but you put a reasonable constraint on this. So as a constraint, associate a cost to this. So what is the cost? The cost is that that you are allowed to remove on average, so at most one minus alpha percent of ages at each, ver each vertex for some alpha less than one. It's not allowed to remove all, all then, then it becomes trivial. So then the theorem says, the first theorem, that there exists a successful strategy at arbitrarily small costs if and only if the group has the Heru property. Okay. And now the flip side. So if you try to find a random invariant strategy of disconnecting the network with the same constraint as before, um, then the second theorem shows that any strategy which is too cheap, meaning that you know, the cost is less than one minus alpha star, whereas alpha star was the threshold, has to fail. Because for such, for such a strategy, the, because of the uniform bounded away from zero property of the two-point function on Kasdan groups, the pairs of vertices will remain connected with uniformly positive density. Doesn't matter how, how far you are. Okay? Irrespective of the distance, there is a strong propensity of you know, um, remaining connected. So yeah, so very robust against all attempts of being disconnected somewhat similar to expanders that Jira was, uh, was saying. Okay. So that's all. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Questions?